There's a run on these cookbooks already. People who couldn't make it um, called us in advance and said, I'm not going to be able to be here, but can you please save me one of these? It's as if they know how great the cookbook is. That they're already like, it's just that we all love cookbooks. So Nancy is going to be handing out the cookbooks to everyone who comes. And um, just as a token of our appreciation and as a token of the connection that we forge here at the Well together, we bond over many different things. This is one of them. So the class that I'm currently teaching here at the Well is a very exciting one because it centers on Sephardic history. It centers on the history of the Jews of Aleppo. And one of our first lessons, we heard such a beautiful and powerful story. And we were also moved by it that I wanted to share it with you today. The story is told about Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky, who was a Magid, one of the few contemporary Magidim of our time. And a Magid is a person, Eastern Europe was replete with Magidim, and his particular task was to go from place to place to inspire Jews with Divrei Torah, Divrei Musar, to awaken them to a heightened and enlightened spiritual practice. And there were many of these Magidim. Today's days we don't have them anymore, almost none. But Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky was a man of that world. He lived in Israel. And the story is told about a time that he met the Chazonish. He went into the Chazonish, okay, 1949, 1950. And the Chazonish name, if I say it to you, it already evokes, but it's Sadiq, what a giant in Torah he was, from his humble seat in Bnei Brak. His Torah, his Kiddushah, emanated throughout the entire world. And Rabbi Yaakov Lutzki went to visit him, came to his study. And as he was standing by the door of his study, he saw the Chazonish hunched over a Sefer Torah, a Torah scroll. And he was looking at the Torah scroll, he was reading, and he was laughing. And he was reading, and he was laughing. Again and again, he saw this. And Rabbi Yaakov didn't know what to do. Bianca was standing there and he just like didn't want to interrupt. This is obviously a scene going on here, and this rabbi is <coughs> laughing about something. But he also felt funny because he had to announce his presence somehow and wanted to know what was going on. So he kind of <coughs> coughed to himself. And Hasani startled, looked up. What's going on? So Hazanish turned to him and said, I'm gonna to explain to you. I am holding a Sefer Torah from the Jews of Aleppo that is said to be 800 years old. 800 years the Jews of Aleppo have been using and reading this Sefer Torah. And it's exactly the same. Every formation of every letter, every word is identical to the Sefer Torah we just inducted into our Beit Midrash last month. So I'm looking at it, and that's why I'm laughing. Because it makes me realize, Kulanu b'nei ish echad nachnu. We're all children of one father. And no matter where we might be on the globe, whether it's Aleppo, or Jerusalem, b'nei brak, or New York, there's one thing that unites us as a family, and it's united us for so many hundreds of years. It's the Torah, it's ours, no matter where we might be. A bit later today, in my class on Sephardic Jewish history, we're gonna talk about how this community, the Aleppo community, the Damascus community, spread out throughout the entire world, diverse communities in many different places, where they held on to that Torah, no matter where they went, in times of peace, in times of war, in times of happiness, in times of sadness. They held on to it, it led them, they protected it, and the Torah protected us and them as well. And one of those places is here. The well is a place where hundreds of women come every week to learn Torah. And it's an amazing thing to see. The women of this community coming to learn, coming to protect themselves with the words of Torah, 
coming to protect the words of Torah in their own home. Our legacy goes on. This Shabbat, we're all going to take out three Sifre Torah. One for Parashat HaShavua, one for Rosh Chodesh, and one for Parashat HaChodesh, Chodesh HaZelachem, because we all know what's coming up. And another thing that we're all going to do, no matter what community we come from, is we're going to reiterate and evoke the words of Moshe Rabbeinu that he said when the Aron, with the Luchot inside of it, was moved from place to place. And the Pasuk that he said was, Kuma Hashem, v'yafutsu evecha, v'yanusu misanecha mipanecha. Hashem, rise up and disperse your enemies and make your foes flee from in front of you. And Moshe said those words. You say those words. I say those words. And those words are our protection, wherever we may go, wherever we might be. <coughs> and we see this tefillah came true because the kehillah, yours, mine, outlasted so many different trials and tribulations. And it's still going strong because here we are. It's beyond miraculous. So Chodesh Nisan is upon us. It's a time of renewal in so many different ways. Chodesh Nisan is a month of redemption. It's a month of Yeshuot. We were redeemed in Nisan. We're going to be redeemed again. And it's a month of women's power to achieve redemption. We redeemed. In our merit, the redemption came in the past, and we know that it will come again in the future in our merit as well. So ladies, we take strength from that. We take strength from the Torah. We take strength from listening to those words. We invest in the power given to us by Hashem that makes us brothers all and sisters all as we do our avodah towards this month, towards this holiday. And we're so privileged to have Rabbi Cherba here with us to empower us, to inspire us, and to move us to uphold the words of Torah as we have with Hashem for so many, so many years. Thank you so much for the opportunity for being here. And I know it's hard to leave the house at this time, smack them all the afternoon. Everyone's busy, getting ready for Yom Tov, cooking and baking and cleaning, and hopefully you'll come home with a Important messages about the holiday about Pesach. Friday night, Bezat Hashem is going to be Rosh Chodesh. The Chachamim bring down that there's something very special about Rosh Chodesh in itself, especially for women. It's a day Yom Tov. But especially the, hal- the Rosh Chodesh Nisan, our rabbis teach us, Nisan Nigalu, Nisan Atidin Nigael. And the month of Nisan, we were redeemed. And it's very muskal that during the month of Nisan, we will be redeemed in the future. This Rosh Chodesh is also very special, especially for the well, that this whole Mosad, this whole Makom Torah, is the Ilu Nishamot, the Sassoon children, who were, each one was a diamond by itself, and Zechutam again Aleinu, and the Gemara teaches us, that tzaddikim, en lahem menucha lo ba'olam hazeh, velo la'olam haba. Tzaddikim have little rest in this world, and have little rest in olam haba. So Rabbi says, what do you mean? He says, yeah, tzaddikim, they're going, they're busy giving shiurim, doing mitzvot, spreading the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And then after 120, they go up to olam ha'emet, and they go reap the benefits. And every mitzvah that they did down here, and other people are doing mitzvah because of them, and they go mechayil el chayil. So bezat Hashem, the should be a zechut, the learning here, and all the other places, should be a liyun neshama for this Shabbat. There should be a, a special zechut for the family, and Bere Olam should give her Mrs. Sassoon and Nechama to know that the Olam Haba began edem ikedem b'mechisitah shel tzaddikim. As we approach this very special holiday of Pesach, which is 
known as the first of the three festivals, which is referred to as the engage engagement between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We know Shavuot is referred to as the Nisuin between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the marriage, and Sukkot is the Yehud coming into HaKadosh Baruch Hu's house. What are the messages the rabbis bring down about Pesach? Is that it's a Ziman Geula, we're celebrating because we were all redeemed. But before we talk about our Geula, let's zone in how we got into Galut. What caused us to go into the bitter Galut where we worked so hard for Paro and for so many years we weren't able to get out? And it stems from the Ben Ishchai that talks about the two dippings on the holiday of Pesach. The first dipping is we take the karpas, we dip it into celery, and the second dipping is taking the marot and dipping it into the haroset. And the two dippings correspond to the two dippings in the Torah. The first dipping is The brothers were in a very big fight with Yosef. They couldn't work things out. They did not want to go to their grandfather. It's hard to talk about it. They didn't go to their father. They decided to take action by themselves. And they took Yosef's coat and they dipped it into blood which represents Sinat Hinam, and from there we all know Yosef ended up in Mitzrayim, and that was the beginning of the problems that we had, and that's the reason why we're in Geula, that's why we're in, in uh, exile. The second dipping represents Utvaltem Badam Hashem Basah. But Olam told us everyone take the blood and put it on the, on the doorpost, and being that we had so much Ahdud, we had so much unity together, that's what brought us out of, of our Galut. Chafiz Chaim explains that we will not be redeemed until this sin is fixed. And we all know that Friday night is going to be the Pesach Seder. And in a couple of months, Tisha B'Av also is going to fall out to be on a Friday night. We don't celebrate on a Friday night. We push it off. And the Ben Chai explains that if we don't get the message of what Sin Atrinam is, then eventually we're going to end up back on the floor on Tisha B'Av for that same sin of Sin Atrina. So the beginning of the entire Pesach, what we, our mindset has to be, is how do we increase more shalom with ourselves, more shalom ben Adam the Haverom, more shalom ben Adam the Ishto, when a person with his husband, with his wife, to make sure that there's always room to grow with shalom. Because that's the most hashuv thing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Says the Havet Chaim, how do you translate Sinat Chinam? If I don't like you because I don't like your car, I don't like what you're wearing, I don't like where you live, I don't like where your kids went to yeshiva, is that Sinat Chinam? For no reason, yes. No, it's no, is it no, I have a reason. I don't like his car. So it sounds like it's, it's childish. Says the Havet Chaim that Sinat Chinam is really one word, and that's called Kinah. And there's four sub Kinah's jealousy. And there's four subcategories why you hate somebody. Reason number one is perhaps the person is richer than you. So you can't say, I'm jealous of his money, but you really are jealous of his money. So you say, I can't stand him, and therefore I hate him, but it's really to do with his money. The second reason for Sinat Hinam is perhaps that person is your competitor, and you feel that he's taking away your parnasa, he's taking away your livelihood, so therefore I hate him. The third element of why a person hates another person is because he gets more kavod than me. I try all day to get the kavod, I can't get the kavod, so therefore I hate him. And the fourth thing he brings down, it's a little hard to understand it, I hate the person because he's such a goody goody. He does everything right. Everything. He just does everything right. He always has derech it's always nice to people. And I'm not that person, I can't be that person. So therefore, I hate him because he's so good. Says the Havet Chaim, we're making a fundraiser. Everyone leave their checkbook at home. I don't need your money, says Bader Olam. Liya Kesef, Liya Zahav. What does Bader Olam want? One thing. He says, Midavek b'midat shalom. When a person has the midah of shalom, that's the segue, that's the beginning of ending all the tzarot that's out there in the entire Am Yisrael, is that when we bring Ahdut more together. So that is the inyan of how we got into the Galut. So if you go to the Matzah Bakery right now, it's very busy over there. And 
And you see a lot going on over there in a hasty way. They're very, very, they're, they're pressured over there. And it's a straight up pasuk from the Torah. And we read it in the Haggadah. We talk about ha lachma'anya. You ask a regular person, why do we eat matzah? They're going to tell you. This is what we ate, moment bread on the way out of Mitzrayim. However, once you go through the Haggadah, you'll see towards the end, it's really not true. Rabbi Gamaliel says, why do we eat matzah? Because it wasn't enough time for the dough to rise. So make up your mind. Was it because this is poor man's bread? Or is it because it didn't have enough time to rise? Says the Chazal, that we have to understand something before that. What do you mean we didn't have food on the way out? This is our provisions on the way out. Do you believe, as Jewish mothers, you would send your children on a, on a trip from here to Borough Park without food? Right? From here to deal without food? We always take food with us. So how could it be that they didn't bake, they didn't cook? It explains as follows. The Abba Olam did tell us we're leaving Mitzrayim. And they did prepare. And they prepared a lot. And what happened? Dam came, but we didn't leave Mitzrayim. They prepared more. They had more makot. And they prepared more and they were more makot. But at the end of the day, we didn't leave. And they gave up. And they said, we're probably not going to leave. All of a sudden, it was Leo Pesach. But Olam tells us, now, right now you're leaving. Ah, all of a sudden, now we're leaving? Okay, so we got to get some provisions, we got to start going. And that's what we came out with. Says Mifarshim, why are we celebrating the whole holiday, it's all about matzah? To teach us that the way Bader Olam does his redemption on a national level, on a personal level, on any problem that a person goes through, Bader Olam works with the midah called ki behipazon. Hipazon means in haste. In fast, that Bitter Olam says, I'm getting you out now, not another minute. You gotta hurry up and it's gonna happen right away. And now that we know Bitter Olam's ways is Bechipazon, and what was the motive of Paro? Paro's element was let them just keep on working. Because when you just keep them working and they're not thinking about a Ki'ula, they're not thinking that eventually will we be redeemed. Says Chazal, that is one of the worst midot the Yetzirah works on more than any other trait is the midah of Yehush. Yehush means despair. And I give up. It's not going to happen. It didn't happen now. It won't happen later. Who says it is going to happen? And Bitter Olam wants to instill in us when we eat the matzah that the HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yeshua'at Hashem Keheref Ayin that the salvation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is by the wink of an eye. That Hashem could change anything in the flesh. And we have to believe. <coughs> and if we eat it and we believe it, then it's going to happen. Like, but Olam told Moshe, tell the Bnei Zdabel, Bnei Sev Yisau. Did anybody budge? Nobody budged. All of a sudden, Moshe says, okay, let's go. But Olam said, go. All of a sudden, there was only one guy. One guy says, okay, we're going out. But said Yisrael, Mim Yisrael, Bet Yaakov, Hayita Yehuda Lekotcha. The Nasi of Shevet Yudai was the only one that said, okay, let's go in. If you dive in first, then Bader Olam says, I'm going to come and I'm going to bail you out. But we have to believe, we have to be sold onto it, that we know that the Yeshua is really going to come. There's a concept in Gemara Baba Metziah called Yehush. I don't think you all learned it. I mean, you probably heard of it, maybe from your children, from your family. But Yehush means as follows, if I find a lost object in the, in the street and there's no name in the, in the envelope or in the wallet, the halakha is, I could keep it. And the reason is because the owner probably gave up hope. If there's a name in it, he probably didn't give up hope, I can't keep it. Says the Mefashim, Yehush, what does Yehush mean? Despair. But Yehush, why am I allowed to keep it? And the Maharal explains, because your connection to something is your hope. And as soon as you sever the hope, the connection is gone. And that's why doctors say that a person that's going through an illness, if he's upbeat about it, and he's optimistic about it, very likely he will get out of that mahala. They will beat it. But what does it depend on? It depends on us 
that we believe that the Hayad Hashem, that Hashem could intervene and change things. And we saw this very recently, two weeks ago, with the story of Purim. How but Olam works in his haste. Mordechai and Esther, they're making a plan to fast and they're praying. All of a sudden, Hashverosh tells Haman in the middle of the night, Maher, hurry up. Hurry up, get the horse, get the clothing, dress him up, and put him on the horse and give him all the kavod. As soon as Haman finishes that day, what does he do? He gets off, he wants to go home and relax. He says, no, no showering, no anything. Right now, you're going to the king's palace. Why? Because when Bidar Olam wants the Yeshua to come, Yeshua Hashem is going to come very, very fast. As B'nai Yisrael, we're referred to as Yehudim. Why Yehudim? Why not Reuvenis? Why not Shimonis? And Mephashim explained that Yehuda went through a lot, a lot of ups and downs. We talk about Yehuda, Vayered Yehuda me'et Echav. Yehuda's brothers told him, we don't want to know you anymore. You're out of the family. Why is he out of the family? Because we sold, we put him in the pit, then we took him out, then we sold him. Had you told us not to sell our brother, we would have listened. And instead, what did you tell us to do? You told us to shecht the goat, dip Yosef's coat in it, and because of that, what happened? Daddy is suffering in pain, and therefore it's all your fault. Yehuda goes, he's not part of the family anymore, and he gets married. And we all know he had three, three children, and he had a du double tragedy. Two of his sons died, and he kept on going. And then, we all know, he gets into the crossroads with Yehuda and Tamar, and now he's facing a very big dilemma. What do I do? Do I throw under the bus and say, terrible story, I can't believe it? Or does Yehuda say, no, I'm going to stand up to my mistake, I'm going to stand up to what's right, tzadikami meni. When Yaakov Avinu wanted a guarantor to see how Benjamin's going to get back, who did he use? Benavshor Kishura, Benavshor is only Yehuda. We have another example of Yosef HaSadik. Yosef the Yosef Hudad Mitzrayma. He also had that same dilemma. Do I do the sin? I don't do the sin. Nobody knows, nobody cares. I'm in the pit anyway. Yosef stands up for the right thing. And what happens the next couple weeks, next pirasha? But what did it come from? It only came because it came during the downtime. And Yudah could have thrown in the towel. And Yosef could have thrown in the towel. And what did they say? No, we got to do what's right. Says Chazal that where does this Midah come from? This Midah comes from our great grandparents, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is married for a very, very long time. He's an old man. Sarah is an old lady. No one would believe that they'll ever, ever have a child. And at that point, when you think it's all over, that's when the Yeshua is going to come. And for that reason, but Olam waited, Vayhi b'chatsi halayla, v'amonai kakol bechor. Kill the bechorim in the middle of the day. What are you waiting for in the middle of the night? When did David HaMelech get up to pray? Hatsi layla, akum dehodot l'achal Hashem. When did Ahasuerus have his meeting with Haman? It was the middle of the night. But Layla, who was in the middle of the night? Says Chazal, because the darkest time of the night is Hatsi Halayla. It's not beautiful outside, like now it's sunny and you can see and you're more clear. At the nighttime is when things start to crush down and you say, I don't know what's going to be. And we start to get crazy and we start to get nervous. And we start to lose a little. Where are you, Akadosh Baruch Hu? No, but Olam says, When you think it's all over, that's when I'm going to come and show you your Yeshua. And that's how we have David HaMelech. It was a crossroad between Ruth and Orpah. We all know the story. Ruth and Orpah were walking on the field, and they were walking Naomi back to Eretz Yisrael. Ruth said, I want to stay with you, Mom. What did Naomi, um, Orpah? Orpah gave her a kiss, and she said goodbye. What did Orpah do that night? Chazal say, she gave up her Judaism, and she did terrible, terrible things. Makara. What, ha what happened to her? 
a, a regular shiksa doesn't do that. The answer is, when a person gives it all up, he's in the hands of the Yetzahara, and he takes him from the highest plateau to the lowest plateau in a flesh. And there's no reasoning. Why? Because the person gave up. And that's when we eat the matzah. What does it represent? It's representing Hayat Hashem Tiksar. Is but Ulam's hand short? Don't you believe he could change things in a second? We have to be sold on it in order to give it over to the children that Bader Ulam's there, he's watching, he's protecting, and never, ever, ever to fall into the Midah of Yush. We go a little further and we talk about. A positive commandment of the night. There's two, only two, right? Even though we do a lot more. But there's two positive commandments in the, in the, the night of the Seder. Number one is, Achilat Matzah. And the other mitzvah is, Be'igata Lebencha. Abrakosot is a drabanan, right? But, uh, but, uh, but, Be'igata Lebencha. To give it over to our children. We all know the great Rabbi Akiva used to learn all day and all night. There were two times a year he came home early. What did he do? He put the kids to sleep, and he took a nap probably also, in order that the children will be up for, for, uh, for the Haggadah. And we know that the whole Haggadah is devoted to the children. We do all these strange acts. We lean, we drink, and then we eat, and we eat again, and then we lean again, and then we eat something that's sharp, all to arouse the children question, answer, to say what's going on in order that we give it over to the children. Right before we left Mitzrayim, Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to give my last speech. What was his last speech? Look in Parashat Bo, it says, Leman, Pasuk says, Leman tisapeh be'ozneh b'ncha, u'ben b'ncha, et asher et alati b'mitzrayim. I want you to tell the children what the mockery I made at Mitzrayim. Ve'et ototai ha'shisam tibam, and all the wonders that I did, vidatem, and you will know, ki ani Hashem, that I am HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ask Chazal, just say, you want to tell it to the children. What's the end of the Pasuk of, vidatem, ki ani Amonai, that you will know that I am HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Says Chazal, the key to that Pasuk is, not that you should say it to the children. I'm talking to you. Vidatem, to the parents. Vidatem, ki ani Amonai. You have to know that it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because once you understand that the miracles were unbelievable from Hashem, and Hashem does have the power to save us, then it'll be very easy to give it over to your children. But if it's just, it's from here to there, and it doesn't mean much, and you're not really living it, you're not feeling it, you're not talking about it, then you're not going to be able to sell it to, to your children. And for that reason, we say in the Beracha Brikat Torah. Make the words of the Torah sweet in my mouth. End of the Pasuk is what? Make sure my children have a, le I have a legacy, children, grandchildren, great grandchildren that are listening to the ways of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Is Chazal two requests in one Pasuk, in one Beracha? It's one per. He says, no, it's connected. How is it connected? Because it's ve'ha'arev na. If it's sweet to you, then you'll have it. If you enjoy checking the dates for haroset, if you enjoy the cleaning, if you put a smile on your face and you say it's the best thing we're doing, whatever we're doing, we're learning, we're praying, we are, we're, we're doing the mitzvot, and it's hard and it's difficult, but then the kids are going to get into it. But if it's a burden on us, then we shouldn't expect them to ever want to enjoy the mitzvah. And for that reason, there's a topic in the Torah at the end about a ben soreh de moreh, a wayward son. No one should ever know. It never happened, never will happen. But it talks about a kid that went off. And it says, Ki ish ben soreh de moreh, enenu shomeya bekol avir bekol imo v'yisiru oto, and you punish him. It says Chazal, just say, he doesn't listen to his parents. Why do you have to say, Ki ish enenu shomeya bekol avir bekol imo, what call? Says Chazal. He didn't hear the call of his father learning. He didn't hear the call of his mother saying to Elim. Because if he would hear the right things in the house, then you will not have a Ben Soder and Moreh. So we do Chesed and we do a lot of learning outside the house. But the stipler brings down, we have to bring it in. 
You have to have a seder out, but you have to seder in. Let the children see that you're loving the mitzvot. And that's expressed from the Malbim in the four sons. We all know the simple explanation, the wise, the wicked, the simple, and the enayodeh The Malbim explains it a little different. The Chacham is not the person that you're thinking in the shul, learning Torah, the Kolel guy, the boy that's learning 10, 12 hours a day in yeshiva. It's not that guy. The Chacham is referring to, he says, a guy doing mitzvot. He puts on tefillin. He's keeping Shabbat. And while he's putting on tefillin, he tells his kids, I have no idea what's in the box. And he keeps Shabbat, and he tells his kids, if I would be in the office today, you know how much money I can make? And by the way, I hope you're learning something. I just got the tuition bill. <laughs> and by the way, the butcher bill also, forget about it. I was looking in the sea town, I was looking in Kefu, whatever, in ShopRite, and the meat is cheap like anything. It's kosher food. It's, it's, it's crazy. It is crazy. But that's the way it is. Okay? So now what happens? This hacham, he comes home, he does the mitzvah, but how does he do it? He does it skeptically. Now what is his kids here? That is so outdated. He doesn't know what he's doing it, why he's doing it, how he's doing it. He's a robot. He's from the old school. He doesn't know what he's doing. I'm not interested. What's that son? Rasha. He becomes the Rasha. He gets married to who knows what. He decides not to, have to send his kids to any yeshiva education. He's raised practically on the street. And once a year, he gets invited to a Pesach Seder by his Jiddo. And he sees Matzah, Maror, Haroset, what's going on? Mazot, he turned into the Tam. And worst of all is this Tam son that he doesn't have a grandfather to go to to go ask, what is this? He doesn't even see what Haroset is. He doesn't know what Matzah is. And that's why. We have to be extremely careful that when we're bringing home the mitzvot, we have to bring it home in a way that it's our zechut, it's our honor, like Rav Moshe Feinstein said, the people that said, the people that said it's difficult to be Jewish, a lot of their children did not marry Yehudim. Because it wasn't given in a way that this is the best thing we should do. And of course, Educate your child according to his way, not to your way, his way, see his strengths, see what he's good at. And when you get it, he gets older, thank you. You will not, he will not remove from you. Shilomo Amel continues and he says, when it comes to Chinuch, there's no one rule. But he says for sure, Al tochach let's pen yisna'eka, hocheach lechacham v'yehaveka. Don't rebuke a scoffer lest he will hate you. Rebuke a wise person and he will love you. Simple explanation is, a smart person enjoys the rebuke, a dip, a foolish person doesn't appreciate it. However, he says, no, says Chazal, al tochach let's. Don't rebuke him like a scoffer. Don't rebuke him and say, you never made it in life, you don't know how to brush your teeth by yourself, you don't know how to pick up your clothes, you don't know how to do anything, you're a slob, you wake up late, you go to sleep, you, you sleep the whole day, you're on your phone the whole time, he's going to hate you. Rebuke him like a wise person, you're so intelligent, you're great. Huh. He will love you for it. And that's what we have to put into our vocabulary to say that he could do it and give him the proper chizuk. I'll tell you two stories. Rabbi Frayn writes about a person that won a contest eating the most matzah balls in New York City. Each matzah ball was the size of a softball, a clincher, a nice, a nice, uh, a nice, a nice uh, matzah ball. And Giuliani was presenting him his award and he asked, you mind if I say a few words before I get this prestigious honor? He said, Fadal, here's the mic. <laughs> say what do you have to say? And he took the mic and he said, if only my father was alive to see that I'm getting such a prestigious honor. And his friends turned to him and he says, what? He says, yeah, 
My father said, I'm a loser, I'll never make it in life. Look, I made it. So if you talk to him like he's a loser and he's not going to make it, he's not going to make it. No question about it. He just sealed his coffin. It's over. And that's what is proven in education, that if you understand the boy, understand his makeup, or the girl, understand where they're coming from, and work with their strength, they will become something. There was a Maaseh Shaya, there were a group of boys that were not doing so good in yeshiva. And when a boy doesn't do good in yeshiva, it's trouble. Because how many spitballs could they throw at the teacher? They get thrown out. Eventually, they get bored. And once they get bored, they get into much bigger trouble. So this group decided, we're going to make prank calls on rabbis. So they decided, one boy decided, they have a list. It's this boy's turn. He called Rav Moshe Feinstein in the middle of the night. Rav Moshe Feinstein was the Gadol Hador, okay, living on the FDR Drive on the east side, the Gadol Hador who barely slept. And his rabbitson answered the phone and said, how can I help you? He says, well, I must speak to the rabbi. He says, all right. Could I wait till the morning? He says, no, it's an emergency. So he woke up, woke up to Rav Moshe, and he asked Rav Moshe, I have a question. Rav Moshe says, I just woke up. Do I have a minute to wash Natila? Or he says, Yeah, you have a minute. Takes the phone, Rav Moshe asks him, What's your problem? What's, what's the issue? And he tells him some bogus question. Rav Moshe realized where this boy is coming from and why he's asking such a dumb question or rude question. And Rav Moshe asked him, What yeshiva do you go to? What are you learning? He told him which Masechta. And he said, All right, get the, get the Gemara. Rav Moshe opened the Gemara, and the boy opened the Gemara, and they're learning. 20 minutes, the same page. Rav Moshe asks him, you got it? He says, no. Hmm. Repeat it again. Rav Moshe tells him, you got it? Good. Now he asks him a question. He says, I have no idea. He says, go to Marty Yeshiva, and ask your Rebbe the question, and let me know. He goes to Mar, he raises his hand. His Rebbe says, yes, you can go to the bathroom. No, 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 I have a real question. Yes, you can get your drink. Yes, you can just, no, I have a question. And he says, before I ask you the question, I want to repeat the Gemara. And he repeats the entire Gemara, question, answer, proof, answer. He knows the cold. And the rabbi's like, wow, what happened? And then he throws the question, and the rabbi says, I have no clue. Where would you get this question? But Moshe finds it. The rabbi worked for one week on this question. It was a hard question. He gives him the answer. The boy calls Rabbi Moshe. And he says, I got an answer. He says, you're going to become great. You just got to keep it up. You got to stay focused. The boy went home. He locked himself in a room. He's not coming out. He's crying hysterical. Mother goes up, not opening up. The father goes up. He's not going up. He's not opening. He says, open up. What's going on? He told him the whole story. And he says, what would have happened if Rabbi Moshe would have hung up the phone on my face? He believed in me. He believed that I could become something and became a great Magid Shirud. But what does it come from? We have to look through the messages and we have to empower ourselves in order to empower our children that they should understand that we believe in them. That when we believe in them, they will come out with something. There's a story with a rabbi that lived on Avenue M and East 8th Street. I don't know if you heard of him, Rabbi Mitnick. He used to live in the neighborhood, and he worked with children or at risk. And he had a certain talent that he knew how to take boys that were all on the fringe, or doing stuff that they shouldn't, and somehow turned them around. And there was a religious family in the neighborhood, very religious, that the boy went off, stopped wearing tefillin, stopped going to shul, got involved with bad stuff, and the parents came and he says, Rabbi, do your magic with him. And he says, okay. Give it, let me give it a shot. He starts befriending with him. He calls him up. He's learning, playing ball with him. And he found out when his birthday is. And he tells him, for your birthday, we're going to shul. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to shul. He takes him to Landau's. Landau's is a minyan factory on Avenue L and Snyder Street. Okay. And they sell the aliyot there. Now, it's going back 25 years ago. So aliyot go there for... Five dollars, six dollars. Now you don't just get Kohen or Levi, you get the whole package. You get Peticha, you get Kohen, Levi, Israel, Jidian, Hagbaha, they call and Glila. 
Okay. So it was a regular standard Monday or Thursday. And he said $5. Another guy said $10. $15. Brother Mitnick said $18. And now, like, looking, this is like Ne'ilah and Yom Kippur, it's back and forth. What's going on? Has they had a, uh, it's going so high. The Gabbai went over to Rabbi Mitnick and he says, listen, there's a Chabad guy in the back. He's doing a business trip. He wants good luck, so he wants the Aliyah. He says, and I want it too. So we're going to bid. 36, 72, it's $100. Now Rabbi Mitnick doesn't know if he has his money on him, how much he has. He looks in his pocket and he's 6'3". He weighs 350 pounds. He goes over to the Teva and he says, $120. Zacha. He gives him, the boy sees this whole thing, and he says, you're going up. He gives him the Aliyah. In the meantime, the Chabad guy got lost. He went downstairs to buy the Aliyah to the next Minyan for $10. And, <laughs> and now Rabbi Mitnick is looking to pay the bill. After Shul, he goes over to the Gabai and he says, let me pay you. He says, tell you the truth, it's paid. Says, it's paid? Who paid it? He says, that guy, the Chabad guy, he paid for you. He says, why did he pay for me? He runs downstairs and he says, my high, why'd you pay the Aliyah? And he says, I was that boy 35 years ago. Wow. No one else took an interest in me. No one cared about me. And I see what you did to that boy. I want to be part of that mitzvah. That's what it means, Vihigata Libincha. When we're talking about Vihigata Libincha, to talk to each one on their own level. Like we all know, at the end of the, the four sons, what does it say about She'en Yodea Lishol? At Petah Lo. What should be the right term if it's the man's responsibility? It should be Ata. Says Chazal, no. Because sometimes the Ata way doesn't work. And what are you stuck with? What do you got to do? You got to do it the At way. The more feminine way, the more warm way, whatever is going to tick the boy or the girl in order to get him around and to bring him around, it's not going to go through speeches and it's not going to be through a lecture. It's all going to be through our actions. If our actions are doing the right thing and we're showing a love, we're showing a passion, we're showing it's our pleasure, then we'll be able to give it over to the next generation. So let's sum it up. We started off with Geulah. We start, we continued with how we got into the Galut. The Galut started with Machloket. Machloket is still prevalent because we're still here. We have to knock out the Galut by Marbe Shalom, getting along with people. The most popular prayer we say is, Ose Shalom. It's the last words in the Amidah. It's the last words in Bikat Kohanim. It's the last words in Kaddish. It's the last words in Gemara. All is around about Ose Shalom Bim Romav. And then the next thing, we continue to know that the Geulah is there. That we can never ever have the spirit. That is the biggest ammunition of the Yetzahara is to tell you the problem is too big. The problem is unsolvable. It's not true. We're eating the matzah because we're representing, because Bir Olam works in haste. He works when the Be'ito comes. When the right time comes, the salvation is going to be over there. And how do we give this over? We have to make sure, as parents, as educators, we have to make sure we are living models that we are trying to show them the love and the passion and the happiness when we do the mitzvah. That's how we'll be able to do it effectively to give it over to the next generation. Thank you for listening. Thank you.